These are my disclosures. Um, first, a few words about methylmonic acidemia. It's a group of autosomal recessive disorders of malinate and cobalamin metabolism. The estimated occurrence of MMA is approximately 1 in 50,000. Uh, the most common cause of MMA is genetic mutations in the mitochondrial localized enzyme methylmonocoid mutase. Um, it, for, for a long time, it's been uh, the gene name's been MUT. Uh, recently, it's changed to MMUT. Uh, probably for most of the talk, I'll refer to it as MUT um, because I have 15 years of historical slides that have it as MUT. Um, one interesting thing about methylmonocoid mutase is it requires the cofactor adenosylcobalamin, which is a vitamin B12 derivative. Um, it's, it's interesting to me because vitamin B12 is found in a number of um, energy drinks, so I'm, I, I, I need to stay awake, so I, take a lot of ener I, I drink a lot of energy drinks, although I'm not really sure what the association is. Um, this, is a, this is a picture of propionate metabolism. Um, it, propionate metabolism, uh, odd chain fatty acids, branch chain amino acids, and propionate from the gut um, come through this pathway as propanol CoA. Um, uh, and eventually, um, is, the MUT converts l methylmonocoA mutase or l methylmonocoA to succinyl-CoA, which eventually feeds into the Krebs cycle. Um, deficits in, in, in methylmonocoA mutase result in elevations in methyl citrate and, and methylmonic acid, um, which, which I'll use as I'll use methylmonic acid as biomarker for some of the studies that, that I'm going to show you. Um, the clinical phenotype in MMA is very complicated. Methylmonocoid mutase is the ubiquitously expressed mitochondrial enzyme. Um, so, so you have um, multi, multi or, organ systems being affected. Um, you have the, the brain, the liver, the kidney. Um, you have um, multiple elevations in, in different, um, in different uh, clinical chemistry markers. So it's, it's a very complicated disease. And uh, before, I, before I move on, I'd like to, to point out that the patient's experience was called metabolic instability. And this is, this is one of the, the most problematic uh, complications of MMA because it's, it's a little bit unpredictable and it can result in uh, coma and death. Uh, the treatments for MMA and outcomes. Um, the, treatment, the main treatment for MMA um, is dietary restriction of the propionate propionogenic precursors, and that, that's usually um, protein restriction. Uh, the patients can be treated with carnitine and or B12 supplementation. Um, not, all, not many of the patients with MUT defects um, respond to B12, but uh, sometimes they do. Uh, liver and or kidney transplantation uh, in severe cases can be, uh, can be considered and, and has been done. And some studies, some, some more recent studies have reported clinical improvements after liver transplantation, so it can be effective. Um, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a number of problems with liver transplantation. Obviously, one is, is it, it's a very um, evasive surgery. It, it can result in um, the, the, the procedure itself can, can um, not always um, turn out well. It requires um, lifelong immunosuppression, and you, you can get graft versus um, host disease and graft rejection. Uh, so despite the current treatments, patients with MMA still experience significant morbi morbidity and premature mortality. And therefore, like so many other diseases, new therapies are needed. And ide ideally for MMA, the treatment would be in the newborn period when the patients are at risk of irreversible complications and death, and these metabolic decompensations frequently occur in the newborn period, but they can, they can uh, occur throughout the life of a patient. Uh, to study the disease and potential therapies for the disease, uh, our lab has created a number of, of mouse models. The first mouse model we created was um, a mouse model of methylmonocoid mutase deficiency by knocking out the third exon of methylmonocoid mutase. These mice are, are neonatal lethal with, with, a, with a almost 100% penetrance. A few mice do escape beyond the neonatal period, uh, so the, um, the phenotype isn't fully penetrant. The mice have elevated uh, methylmonic acid levels, and um, that's it. So, so, so the next thing we did is on the background of the knockout mouse model, we, created a, we tried to create a hypomorph by expressing the methylmonocoid mutase only in the, um, in the muscle and cardiac cells. 
And this, this prevented the, the neonatal lethality. These mice still, um, still are not, um, they don't survive like normal mice, but they, they survive beyond the neonatal period. They have elevated levels of methylmonic acid. Um, and these, these have been um, of great utility because it allows us to have um, untreated control mice for some of our experiments, which is hard to get with our, our neonatal lethal model. So, so initially, um, back in early 2000, we began doing experiments with adeno-associated virus, and these are some, some of the, you know, I list some of the reasons at the time why, why we were interested in, in, in doing uh, adenoviral gene therapy. There have been numerous uh, serotypes isolated, um, and, and as, as you probably noticed in the meeting, um, many new capsids by, by capsid engineering. Um, these, interestingly, these capsids, although, although they're not significantly different in the, uh, the amino acid sequence, they do ex exhibit uh, very specific tropisms to different tissues. Um, and, and these, although AAV is episomal, it's known to express the transgene for, for years. Um, and it's been proven to be safe and efficacious in, in, new, in a number of clinical trials now which wasn't the case when we started in, in uh, early 2000. So these are showing some of our old results. These are all published results. It's, it's accumulation of, it's a compilation of a number of different gene therapy experiments we did in our neonatal lethal model, showing survival after gene therapy, both using two different serotypes, AV8 and AV9, and ubiquitous and liver-specific promoters. So, so they all worked well, in the, in, and a majority of them mice survived um, for over a year. Um, similarly, we saw long-term uh, metabolic correction or at least um, reduced methylmonic acid levels um, in the mice. Um, once again, uh, one, of the, one of the shortcomings of the neonatal lethal model is we, we can't um, generate um, control values for these mice. We have some historical values that we use for, for, for MMA comparison, and we, we can only go out to two months with those. Um, I'm just pointing out here that one of the problems we, we saw w w delivering um, doses in the new and new period is we saw a reduction in transgene expression over time, which is, which is well documented um, to occur uh, in, in RNA and protein. And, I, at, and at the bottom of the slide, the pointer is not working. You can see at 24 hours, you have almost 100% or over 100% of what, what wild type uh, expression is. And then at 72 hours, you have like probably 50 to 100 fold uh, wild type expression. And then at 90 days, it drops off to about 50%. And then at a year, which I'm not showing the Western blots, you, you, we can't even detect the protein. So that was one shortcoming. Another shortcoming of doing a gene therapy with AAV in, in, the, uh, in the neonatal pair for, for us in particular was we experienced um, this genotoxicity, which, which was first reported by DeSante um, et al. And we, we experienced it in our mice of MMA. Uh, a recent article showing that wild type uh, AAV integrations might be involved in hepatocellular carcinoma in humans also raised uh, the concern about this toxicity for us and, and others, although that, that paper is, is somewhat controversial in the field. Uh, I just want to, this is, this, is public, this is all published work, but I just wanted to review it real quick because this is one of, the, one of the concerns for us, is in our mice we, we saw a high rate of hepatocellular carcinoma in mice treated with AAV, but not in untreated mice. Um, we theorized that, that this was occurring because of um, transactivation of, of, um, of microRNAs and other genes. Um, in proximity to um, these integrations in the rean locus. A lot of the integrations we found were in MIR-341, a micro, or in or around very close to MIR-341, but not all those integrations. And this, 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 our theory is partly based on what a, what a, what a previous study had shown, is that if you take um, an AV with arms of homology to the rean locus and integrate in just the promoter enhancer of chicken beta actin, you can cause cancer. Also shown on, on the bottom side, sorry the pointer is not working, is some, some, um, it's not just an AAV phenomenon, it's showing some sleeping beauty integrations that were done in a previous study um, where, they, where they also found um, they resulted in hepatocellular carcinoma and toxicity. So because of the problems we experienced, um, 
there, there, there is a kind of a solution that, that came out, at least for some of our problems. It's a promoterless gene targeting uh, without, without a nuclease. And this, 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 um, this type of technology is now, now coined gene ride. Um, it, I'm showing on the left a, a number of papers that are, have already shown that gene ride can work for, for different diseases, in particular hemophilia B, Krillier and Ajara, um, and uh, ant antitrypsis or alpha antitrypsis deficiency. And then the, the, the last paper, a universal s system to select gene modified hepatocytes in vivo, uses the gene ride system and sets up a, an environment where you, where you actually get selection even if your d disease doesn't have selection. So I'm not going to cover any of these papers in detail for, for, um, for time reasons, but I wish the pointer would work. Okay, so just, just basically how the gene ride works is it has arms of homology to the albumin locus. It integrates in at the, at the end of the albumin by the stop, and it, it utilizes a 2A element once it's integrated to, to, um, to it'll, you'll get a fused RNA after integration, and then due to ribosomal skipping at the 2A element, you'll, you'll end up with two peptide products one being a transgene and one being albumin. So just to move on, our, f our first studies were like, were very, were very crude because the first question we wanted to answer is with gene ride, could we actually um, get it to work in, in mice with MMA? So we selected our hypomorph. We used um, high doses just based on some estimates that we had. We thought we needed to correct about 10% of the cells. Uh, previous studies had shown that, that after gene ride in, in, in early time points, they were only getting about the, the low percentage of like one, one percent or about one percent, some, some maybe a little bit higher. But uh, so based on that, we went in with a high dose. And our, the question we were trying to ask is, will this, will this work? Will it express protein? Will it lower MMA levels? So this is just showing some, some the, MM, the methylmonic acid levels were significantly increased after um, after treatment with gene ride over time in the mice, and we, we followed them out to 12 to 15 months. And it seemed like there was um, a, like a threefold decrease over time, which is a little bit unusual than what we're used to seeing with episomal AAVs, in that we, we do see a, a slight decrease over time, but, but not, not quite at this magnitude. So we were wondering if, if, that, was, if that was, you know, somehow significant. We were a little bit surprised. So as far as the growth in the hypermorphic mice, mouse model of MMA, we saw a, a significant difference only at one month. And then the mice grew relatively well and looked healthy, but um, they never achieved the, the weight of their wild type mice. And they, they, the, the weights were never significantly higher than, than untreated mice, except for at the one month time point. So we did a second pilot uh, study in our, in our mutant mouse model just once again asking this question, can we rescue these mice? Um, we started out with a hypermorphic mouse model because we thought because we were relying on homologous recombination that, that the, uh, the transgene expression would be somewhat slower than, than, the, um, than the traditional AAVs we used in the past that were promoter driven. And what we found is in a small number of mice, we were able to rescue the neonatal phenotype. Um, and Although we didn't significantly lower the MMA, the MMA is tending to be lower and it remains stable in a, in a very small number of mice out to um, 15, 12 to 15 months. And uh, similar with growth, uh, we didn't see um, any significant growth at any time point, but the mice did grow over time and did look healthy. They never achieved um, the weights of the wild type mice. So, because both of these mouse models are nulls in the liver, um, we're combining, I'm, I'm showing you the, the data combined because they're absolutely null for the liver for the, for the expression of the methylmonocoa mutase protein. Um, and, and we should be able to detect this without, without any background because we're using a codon optimized uh, MUT sequence. So for RNA, um, we should be able to, we, we should not get any background for anything we do. Uh, so. It, to the first one of the, one of the first six, some of these first experiments I'm showing is we determined the AAV copy number, 
And after neonatal delivery, we're seeing what, what you'd expect to see, high copy numbers early on at one month of age, and then they're rapidly um, decreasing over time. And that's because the, the AAV itself is mostly, the copy number is mostly coming from episomal AAV. Um, and then we looked at the actual, the, the, the albumin out of, um, integrations by a, a long, a long range uh, PCR and quantification. And what we see is in, 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 at the early time points, we have a really low integration. We see really low, a really low number integration, about a half of a percent, which is similar to, to low integration seen in, in earlier studies at early time points. But interesting, what we see in the, in the, in the MMMice is a, is a, is a 24 fold increase in the number of AAV integrations we're detecting. Whereas in wild type mice that were treated at the same time, we're not seeing that enrichment suggesting that there may be um, some type of selection or, or some other mechanism going on to enrich the, um, the, uh, the corrected uh, cells later in life. Um, so so the, next, uh, we, the next thing we did is we did, we did some RNA in situ hybridization using this uh, relatively new technique called RNA scope. And, and the main difference is it uses, these, it uses two um, probes, these Z probes, and then it has a secondary marker come on and hybridize to the Z probes. And the Z probes have to be exactly spaced. They're about 20 nucleotides long in order for the secondary um, probe to come in and bind. And that gives it a greater specificity. And for each one of these assays, they design about 20 of these Z probe sets. So, so it's highly specific. And it, for us, it was a real breakthrough because we had tried for years to um, do immunohistochemistry using different mut, um, antibodies, and it never works. So we, the one thing that we always had a question is like, well, we know how much protein expression we're getting in the liver. We know how much RNA, but we really didn't know how many cells we were correcting. So here's showing the results um, of, the, of, of the gene ride treated animals. At two months early on, we, we, see, um, we see very little um, staining, very little corrected, um, a small number of corrected cells. Um, in the MMA mice, and then at 15 mice, um, corresponding to kind of what we see as far as the integration copy number, we see a increased staining um, in the 15 old, in the 15 month old mice um, for for mutt RNA, and these stains are specific for mutt, so so they're staining only for mutt. Uh, and then in the wild type mice, similar to what we saw in the integrations, we see very little um, staining. Suggesting that the, in the in the liver of the MME mice, there's some kind of selective advantage for corrected cells versus non-corrected cells, and s since all all the cells in the in the wild type liver have mutase expression, there, there's no advantage. And then we quantified a number of these a number of these litters li livers, sorry, um, and we saw that that overall there's a five-fold increase in in expression in the MMA livers between one and two months and 12 months. And then, and then similarly, what we showed in the wild type is that, that we don't see that type of um, increase in expression. So next we looked at, at mutt protein in these livers and we saw the, the same thing. We saw at one and two months, we had low expression about, about on the order of 10% on average. And then in the older mice, in the 15, to 13 year old, 13 month old mice, not 13 year old, sorry. We saw increased expression in all except one of our mice. Some of these mice are over 100% corrected. Uh, one of the mice um, is kind of an outlier in all of our studies. Um, we believe it was, I, I, what I surmise it is, is it's, it's, a, it's a technical problem with the injection. Um, because we were delivering such high doses, we were, we were, we were um, injecting high volumes in, um, interhepatic and, and and in some of these mice, that, that does tend to back leak. So th this is um, the quantification of these results. And we see a significant increase in protein, about actually five-fold increase in mutt protein over time, on average. So the obvious question is, what might be driving the growth advantage for corrected hepatocytes in the MMA liver? And this is um, studies that we did back in 2009, and other groups have done, done similar studies where, where there's um, the mitochondrial, a hepatic mitochondrial phenotype in these mice and in humans. Um, they have dysmorphic mitochondria, sometimes called megamitochondria. 
and they have electron transport chain deficiencies, and they have um, ab ab aberrant uh, glutathione enzyme expression where they're low, so that, that could cause oxidative stress. And, and other studies, not, that, not, not, not actually in this paper, have, have shown that, that, that there can be oxidative stress. So that, that would explain why potentially these corrected cells have a growth advantage in the environment of the MMA liver. So these are ongoing studies done by our postdoc, Leia Venturi. So I'm going to present the results we have at this time. But now what we're trying to figure out is, you know, what's the time course of this selective advantage we're seeing? Is it simply after a few months, we kind of reach a steady state and it kind of just chugs along? Or does it continually increase over time where you just continually um, cr uh, enrich for the corrected cells? So the experimental design is we're, we're delivering two different doses now. We, we, we're going with a lower dose. These still are relatively high doses, a lower dose and a high dose, into our hypermorph mo model because it's easier. We, we can get um, comparable results over time where we can't do that with our knockout mouse. So, so this is a, always a better mouse for us to use. And what we see as far as survival, and this is like, you know, this is relatively new. We knew that the, that the this hypomorphic model, although it, it survives the neonatal period, we knew that there, we, we had a, quite a bit of lethality, but we didn't really have a, we, we really hadn't tracked it carefully, but more recently we started tracking it carefully. And we show, we, we see correction in the treated mice, or, or at least we see a trend towards um, greater survival in the corrected mice, but for some reason out at a, somewhere between weaning and, and 90 days, we lose a lot of mice in both groups, and, and we're still not really sure why that happens. But uh, showing the MMA, the MMA is in, in both uh, in both the uh, both the dosing groups is lower over time. Now we don't have a lot of data out at the later time points, the the, the six to eight months, so that's ongoing. Um, but but early on, we're seeing significant reductions in MMA, and then similarly the weight. We see, um, we see in, in our um, low dose group, which is actually the group where we have, have a, a greater number of mice, we see significant increases in weight compared to the untreated controls at three, four, and five months. But then after that, it, it, it's, it's unclear because once again, we don't, we, this is an ongoing study where we don't have um, time points out later. So um, we also looked at so I showed earlier that that this this um, technology results in two peptides, and the albumin actually has some of the 2A sequence on. And this work has really been done by um, by Logic Bio, and they've been d developing this this assay. So this the albumin is secreted into the into the plasma, and you can actually measure that as a biomarker to try and get an idea of of what expression is over time. So these are some of our preliminary results that, that once again, was, uh, these have been generated at Logic Bio. Um, so, so what we see in our higher dose group is we actually see these 2A, these, this 2A assay, we see, we see it go up more rapidly than our, in our lower dose group. Um, the one thing that I want to point out is, is this is like assays still under development. And the ones that you're seeing at like uh, the 75 micrograms per microliter, the ones at the top, that's, they're actually going to be, that's at the upper detection limit of the assay. So they could be 75 or greater. So we're, so that, I think that's being worked out where they're, where they're trying to develop, where they're trying to troubleshoot the assay so they, so they can, so they can um, measure, um, measure 2A peptide above that level. So as far as the gene ride uh, safety profile, we talked about some of the problems we had in neonatal delivery. This is an important time you know, that we'd like to treat uh, patients with MMA is early in life, not later in life. And we had the uh, liver problems, but fortunately, um, with 10 mice treated tr treat with extremely high doses, higher than what, what we used in our initial studies where we observed hepatocellular carcinoma, we saw no signs of hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, we took that one step further. We looked for, for any microscopic indications of hepatocellular carcinoma, and this was done by a, a a vet pathologist at the NIH, and she saw so, no signs. And then 
what I'm, what we're, what we're, what we tried, to, what you can see, but you can't see it in the slide. And what the pathologists can see is they can see slight improved cell, slight improvements in the cellular morphology in the areas of staining um, versus the H, H and E stains. So they can kind of go back and forth and see that. I, at this level, I can't, I can't show that, but I thought I'd mention that. I, th I thought that was interesting. Um, in conclusion, we have demonstrated that gene ride um, technology is efficacious in two murine models of MMA. Um, after neonatal gene delivery, we observe stable, long-term hepatic transgene expression from this promoterless integrating vector. The percentage of uh, vector integrations, the amount of MUT RNA and the amount of MUT protein in livers treated with gene ride. Um, increase over time in a, in a time-dependent fashion, demonstrating a growth advantage in the livers uh, for corrected cells in the livers of our MMA mice. Unlike um, AVs that rely on um, enhancers and promoters for transgene expression, we observe no genotoxicity after gene delivery in the neonatal period. Um, and the amount of transgene expression and the number of corrected hepatocytes Incre are increasing in a temporal fashion due to this growth advantage in the corrected hepatocytes, which should uh, give us increased efficacy for this vector that relies on um, you know homologous recombination, which 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 is low. So initially, before we, when we started these experiments, you know people had surmised for a long time that, that a suspected you know that you might have a growth advantage because of what's going on in the hepatocytes and the mitochondria. Uh, but we never really saw it until we used this, this um, integrating vector. You won't, you won't see the, the, um, the growth advantage in the episomal vectors that we used in the past. So I'd like to acknowledge um, all our collaborators at Stanford, at Logic Bio. It's, it's been really fun to work with everybody and uh, take any questions. Randy, I have a question. So it would be uh, quite fascinating to look at this clonal expansion over time in the liver. I know you've been following the levels of <coughs> MMA, for example, but are you planning some can experiments to follow what's going on in the liver to see if these expansions continue oh, uh, yeah, at for, further time points? I know you've looked out as far as 15 months, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah. and so, th so that the last study that, that Leia Ventura is actually the postdoc who's, who's kind of taken over, the last study that's kind of ongoing, that, that's kind of the plan for that. We, we plan to take down animals every month, do the RNA scope experiments, the protein, so we can watch it. And, and you know, talking about this, I mean, depending on what we see, we might want to take those studies out even further to see if we continuously get the clonal expansion. So very interesting work. So um, may I? Yeah. Yes. So, so uh, do you try to transplant hepatocytes in those in that model? So I mean, you have a selective advantage. You know, probably transplantation of hepatocytes could actually, you know, push those hepatocytes to, to grow. That would be, I think, like the killer experiment. You know, for the selection. Do you try to to, to enhance enhance the selection even further? Uh, you know, actually, you know, to prove actually you really have, you know, a selective advantage, you know, I think that really the killer experiment, besides the one you have already with the nodules, right, it will be, you know, to explore also, you know, might be transplantation, hepatocyte transplantation. If you have an advantage, those should grow, you know. Yeah, right yeah, and, and we, 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 I think we've talked about doing like um, partial hepatectomies to see if it grows out and, and, and things right. like that. And yeah, yeah I, th harsh. I think <laughs> that would be good to, to try. Right. We, have, we have some pretty good veterinarian support that could probably help us with that. I see. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's, a, that's a great suggestion. Okay. So last, last thing, so do you got any also integration somewhere else besides albumin? We, we haven't checked. Okay, thanks. Can your RNA scope assay distinguish monoallelic versus biallelic integrants? Do you get one level or two level and then look at the relative amount of each of those populations with time? Um, I don't. I don't think it can. I mean, so so the so what you if you if you yeah. blow those up, you can actually see dots, and you can quantify it by the number of dots in each cell. But I I don't think it's. I, I'd have to ask because some we have a a core that's doing this, but I think that would be a little bit tricky. Thanks. Uh, 
So, so great work. Um, I was curious, uh, do you see this selection also if you treat the mice with gene ride at later, later in time, like when they are more grown? Well, I, th I think they... they and, and, or, and, and with AV gene transfer? Yeah. Well, some, some of the, um, the, the earlier experiments with gene ride that, that I showed showed that you could, you could correct if you treat later, but we, haven't, we have some um, older mice that we just treated, and we're looking into that, but we don't know. So, okay. but, yeah. Because if you have an, a, an advantage due to, tra due to the transgene correction, I would expect also to observe with, uh, with canonical gene transfer. Right? Uh, AV, gene, gene, AV gene transfer. We, we wouldn't suspect without, that. Without the gene ride, no. It, I, I, I guess you would have to do that maybe in the MCK model in adult. Yeah, well, I mean, with a, with, a, with a canonical AV, we wouldn't expect a growth advantage because it doesn't integrate and it won't be passed on to the. To if, the you do, if you do when, when the mice are grown, no, you don't expect such a dilution because of the. I don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The MCK yeah. model, maybe. You yeah, would. I mean, but. Ideally, our ideal therapy would be early in life, just because of all the problems that the patients experience. All righty, very interesting. Um, I think it's interesting that you don't rescue the, the body weight phenotype with you know, liver you know, replacement of, of MUT. And so I guess it begs the question, do these mice have uh, you know, a malabsorption? And you know, do you really need to replace it also in the intestine? Or do you think, uh, you know, maybe this is due to some perturbation in bile acid metabolism? Or, I mean, obviously, if the mice survive, that's better than not. But, you know, in terms of treating patients with MMA, is that something we need to think about? Or uh, Yeah, I mean, it, 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 is, it is a little, I mean, I don't have an answer for that. It is a little bit different than what we see in, in a lot of other things where we, where we do see weight increases um, after treatment, even if we just, only target the liver. So it, the lack of weight gain, I, I don't really have an explanation of, of that. We do see some weight gain, but it's... So it's I guess if you, to rephrase it, in your earlier studies when you just do sort of additive gene therapy with AAV overexpression in the liver, does that rescue the body weight? Um, yeah, type? yeah. It, 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 well, n n nothing rescues the body weight completely. And we do yeah. see increases with gene ride. Um, but we, normally we, we see in increases over the, so, so some of the, the studies are ongoing, so yeah, I, I, I don't have an explanation, for, but liver, liver directed gene therapy increases the body weight. N none, of the mi none of the treatments ever get the mice to, to wild type. Okay, thanks. That was a, a great presentation. I'm, I'm the editor of Gene Therapy, and I have a general concern regarding AAV gene therapy and the lack of integration studies, and I think your model is excellent in, in this context. So for a start, uh, if you think that transactivation may be the reason for the hepatocellular carcinoma, have you explored the possibility of changing the promoter driving that transgene to see whether, similar as it has been done in the context of retro and lenti, you can prevent uh, the cancer from happening? Um. So if you think it's transactivation, perhaps mediated by the promoter present in AAV upon integration, if you change the promoter to remove any enhancer activity, you may be able to reduce or eliminate oh, that yeah, transactivation. Yeah, for sure. And, and in some of the studies, some of the work we publish, we showed that, that, some, that some promoters, we don't see the cancer. It's, it was a small number of mice, but for instance, APO, APO E, H hat, th that, that combination of enhancer promoter. We didn't, we didn't see the cancer, but it was a small number of mice and we haven't done any follow-up studies. Okay, so and there's a scope for that. And I was wondering whether you could actually combine a non-carcinogenic AAV for early delivery at high level, as well as your gene rider type for long-term rescue. So yeah. a combinatorial approach of the two, acute rescue followed by long-term rescue, rescue by the gene rider. Yeah? Yeah. But, but generally, I think what you are doing, looking at integration here is very important and is relatively neglected in the AAV field. So thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.